Yay, yay. What's up, what's up? Hey, my name is John. Uh, this is my friend, Lewis. Can you say, what up, what up Lewis? What's, what's up, what's up? What's up, what's up? What's up, what's up? Uh, I think I know why everyone's here tonight. And, and it's the same reason that we're here tonight. It's to be unleashed by the unlimited love of God. Am I right? That's why we came? That's right, that's right. That's right. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to talk to you guys for about 25 minutes. And uh, our hope and our prayer has been that no matter what you did last year, no matter what you did last night, that today a vision will grab a hold of your heart that is way bigger than any of your failures, that is way bigger than anything uh, that maybe you're regretting in your life, that a vision will grab hold of your heart tonight that is bigger than your mm -hmm. life itself, that Jesus would speak to you very personally. So I'm going to pray. And then we're going to talk to you guys for a few minutes. God, you're in this place, and we give you full reign and full freedom to do what we've asked you to do, for you to unleash us, that your spirit would move in a powerful way, that you would take our ordinary lives and you would do extraordinary things in us. God, we ask for you to do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, so we're here to be unleashed, right? So here's what I want to do. I just want to make sure. So this section over here on the count of three, I want you to say unleashed. One, two, three. Unleashed. All right, that's going to be hard to beat, but I think middle section, you can do it. One, two, three. Unleashed. Pretty good. Over here, you can do it. One, two, three. Let's go. Unleashed. That's right. That's right. Dang. I don't know. Who did it? I don't know, man. I think we might have a left over here. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk to you guys about a story that spills out of the pages of Luke chapter 15. And I know most of you didn't bring your Bibles, but that's all right. We're going to throw it on the screen for you. There is a story that takes place in Luke 15 where Jesus begins to talk about this kind of vision, that it would grab a hold of your heart, that it would unleash you. And we're going to start here with Lewis uh, in verse 11. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. You see, we find here the father and his two sons, an older son and a younger son. The younger said, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with this leash that you hold on me. Now give me what you owe me, basically, is what he said. Basically, he said that I wish you were dead, because typically that what happens when a father dies and he leaves the estate to his children. And so dad, being a loving dad that he was, he gave into his son. He went, he went to Chase or maybe U.S. Bank. <laughs> He closed his account. He cashed in his 401k, and he sold all the stock, and he gave him. He gave him his fair share, and the son was happy because for the first time in his life, that leash was taken off, and he became a man, so he thought, and so he left. He left from the suburbs and went to the city of Chicago and had a real good time, real good time with the prostitutes, with the drug dealers, with gambling, with all these things, he just let it all go, and then he found himself in a situation where he had nothing. Found a situation where he lost everything. The story continues. It says, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So here's what's going on in this story. Jesus is telling this story not in 2015, obviously, right? He's telling it back in the first century. And as Jesus is telling this story, the people that are listening, uh, they understood some things. And what the audience understood was this, is that if you were a Jew, it was illegal for you to be around pigs. And as Jesus gets to this part in the story, the master storyteller, Jesus himself, he says that things got so difficult that this guy began to eat with the pigs himself. And as Jesus delivered these words, you can just imagine, if you'd lean into the story, right? You can just imagine the jaws of those listening just dropping to the floor. Why? Because this was the worst nightmare for any Jew. 
that life would get so difficult, that their bank account would get so bankrupt, that they would stoop so low, that they would have to be eating with pigs themselves. It was even in the law, the Jewish law, that if you even touched a pig, that meant that you were unclean for at least seven days. And so this story, I believe it meets us here tonight. And we're talking about this unleashed vision, but the reality is before you ever get unleashed, junior high student, before you ever get unleashed, high school student, you got to ask the question, what are you leashed to? What are you tied to? What are you tethered to? I know you left home to come here, but the reality is whatever you were tied to back there followed you here. Whatever you were leashed to back in Naperville or in Lamont or in Elk Grove, wherever it might be, it followed you here. And what we see happening in this story is Jesus is beginning to set up this incredible opportunity for this guy to leave this kind of leash life to begin to live an unleashed life. This next phrase is one of my favorite phrases in all of the Bible. It says, when he came to his senses. I want you guys to say that with us on the count of three. One, two, three. When he came to his senses. Man, when I came to my senses, it was 19 years old, sitting in a jail cell, wishing I had a 357 so I can just blow my brains out. I never thought my life would end up there. You see, I had a leash on me too at a young age. And it kept me away from all the gangs and the drugs and the alcohol and all of those things in the area where I grew up at. But by the time I was 15, my father was murdered and the drug deal gone bad. And at that point in my life, that's when I took the leash off. I just grabbed it and I snatched it off because I was hurt and I was tired and I wanted to have things my way and do what I wanted to do. And what did I turn to? To the very drugs and alcohol to end in my father's life. But that wasn't it. I didn't know how to stop because, see, once that leash came off, I went crazy. It went to drug dealing. It went to drug using. It turned into drive-by shootings where I was known as a drive-by kid where I was from in East St. Louis. And it all culminated in that minute when I'm sitting there just waiting, waiting and wishing that I had a gun, but I didn't. You see, just moments before that, a guy gave me a gift. He gave me a gift of some things that I didn't have. And because of that, I thought he was trying to make a move on me. And so I rushed into his cell to take his life. And that's why I encountered Christ when he was having Bible study in his cell. And he handed me a little pamphlet about God. And as I sat there and contemplated what was going on, I finally realized that the life that I was living was no life at all. The power that I was seeking was the wrong power. The things that I was seeking was wrong. The friendships that I was seeking was all wrong. And in that moment where I saw God met me right where I was at, I was sentenced to life plus 100 years. I was never getting out. I had every reason to want to take my life. Who wants to spend the rest of their life in prison? So I decided to put a leash on myself, actually. It was a leash where I gave God the power and control in my life to direct my steps in every aspect of my life. And by his grace, after 15 and a half years, I was released. I was unleashed back into society. And that was just five short years ago. And I can tell you that because of my dedication to Christ and giving my life to him and stop trying to do it on my own and stop caring about these no good relationships, I finally found something for the first time in my life that meant something to me, that I could pour myself into. I felt like I was relevant. I felt like I mattered. And I felt like someone loved me. And that someone was God. Yeah, for me, amen. When I came to my senses, uh, Let's just keep it real. I, I, don't even, I didn't even know where to find guns. Uh, I didn't use drugs. I was not known as a, someone that could drive by, shoot. I, I would have probably shot myself. Um, I grew up in like East Roselle, not East St. Louis. Uh, I'm a suburbanite, like 99% of you guys uh, in here at least. Uh, <clears throat> we cheer because uh, we're from the suburbs. That makes sense. And so I grew up probably like a bunch of you guys grew up, and, and so my story is very different, but uh, the end is the same. 
Uh, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't drugs, and it wasn't gangs, and it wasn't guns, but for me, it was popularity, and it was sports. And uh, I went to Lake Park High School and was an All-American there. Uh, oh, we got some... Hold on a second. Lancer for life up here, baby. Uh, <clears throat> I was All-American there, and so I had an opportunity uh, to play Division I football and baseball, and I decided to play uh, Division I baseball. And, and for me, um, what began to happen was athletics became my identity, and some of you, you understand that. Uh, I, I went to college, and I went to college with good intentions, but what began to happen was my life began to spiral out of control. You see, actually, I grew up as a pastor's kid. Uh, I, I knew all about God, but throughout my college days, I began to understand that I didn't know God. And for me, I wasn't sitting in a jail cell. I was actually playing baseball one summer in Caracas, Venezuela, if you'd believe that. And I was there, and I was playing. It was a Sunday. It was actually on Father's Day. And I was halfway through my college career at this point, having tons of success athletically, but the reality was my life was completely bankrupt. I mean, I had been running from God. I mean, I had been sprinting from God. And it was on that Father's Day, sitting in a different country, where I understood that, you know what, I know all about God, but I don't know God. And the difference between those two is very wide. You know, some of you here tonight, you know all about God. You do. But I want to ask you, do you know him? I mean, do you, do you know him? Do you feel him? You know? Like, do you, do you sense his presence in your life? I mean, as you walk up and down the hallways of your junior high or high school, do you, do you really know that you're not walking alone? And for me, it was on that Father's Day. And I was 21 years old. And I got to the point, I just said, you know what, Jesus, I, I'm done trying to do my own thing. I'm done trying to drive my own life. I'm done trying to call the shots in my life. I'm ready to come to my senses, and I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to surrender everything to you. The story continues in chapter 15, verse 17. When he came to his senses, the younger son, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You see, he could have just stayed where he was at. But no, he chose to go back. He didn't let fear hold him back. Yeah, it was scary where he was, but it might have been even scarier eating crow and swallowing his pride and going back. It could have been defeat. You know, he went out on his own and he tried it. So he thought, and he didn't make it. And the beautiful part of this story, which is my favorite, is the picture of this younger brother going back to his father, him humbling himself. Just like I did, just like maybe many of you did, and maybe, hopefully, like many of you will do tonight, is to humble yourself and basically just go back and say, hey, I made a mistake, and I realized I can't do this on my own. You see, the father didn't have a long list of requirements or a bunch of hoops that he had to jump through to earn his love back. You see, as soon as he came back, he threw his arms open wide, and there was his beloved son, despite him almost wishing he was dead, asking for inheritance, and going out into the world and just, just wasting everything that he had worked for. See, he didn't care about that. Just like God doesn't care about any of the mistakes that we've made. I want you to truly hear this. God does not care about any of the mistakes that you have made, that I have made, that John has made. What he cares about is that surrender and us coming back. Mm -hmm. And just saying... Here I am, Lord. Here's all of me, this broken person who's made mistakes after mistake after mistake. I don't know where my life is going. I don't know what direction I have in my life. And you know what the Father says? That's okay. That's okay. Let's, let's work this through together. This is a relationship. This isn't a God who is, is so far away and so distant that we have 
nothing, no kindred spirit or anything. This is a God who wants to be involved in our lives, just like we can see in this story. So he throws his arm wide open, and he's just waiting. He waited on me, he waited on John, and he's waiting on every one of us in this room to just come and wrap our arms around him. One of my favorite parts, I want to make sure we understand something, is the way Jesus told this story completely redefined love. You know, we come up with our own understanding of love and, and we, we build kind of a frame around it or we build kind of these, these margins around it. And what Jesus consistently did when he would tell stories and when he would teach is he would talk about this kind of love that defied category. I mean, did you catch that part? He said when the, when the younger son was still a long way off. Just picture this, all right? So here's the younger son right here. And it says that he came to his senses. And what that means is repentance. It's a church word that means this right here. It means turning from, right? Because he was headed that way. And the younger son turned from and he turned to his father. And what's incredible is this, is the way Jesus said it. He says, as the child, the son was walking back. It said that even as he was a long way off, it says that the father didn't wait for him to get there, right? The father didn't have kind of this checklist that the younger son needed to do. I mean, it was actually Jewish law that you would have to go through a seven-day ceremonial cleansing process, but the father didn't care, right? I mean, Jesus said that the father got up from where he was sitting because he was watching. I mean, get this. It says that the feet of the father began to move towards his son. And if you get anything, you need to understand this. The feet of mercy are always faster than the feet of repentance, The feet of the father are faster than the feet of the son. The father didn't wait. The father ran towards his son. Man, he met him. I mean, can you imagine what those must have been thinking when they heard Jesus talk about this kind of love? And you and I, the reality is, even those that are following Jesus, we still fill our minds with the misconceptions of the love of God. But in Luke chapter 15, Jesus set the record straight. There is no other love like this. The kind of love of a father that would love us on our worst day to the degree that he would send his son Jesus to die for us. What does God's word say? It says that even while we were in the act of sinning, Christ died for you. And that means that you're not forgiven because of how good of behavior you have. It means that you are forgiven when you repent and you turn to him and he comes and he meets you where you're at. Unleashed. It's the vision for this weekend. The reality is this, and this bothers me, but but let me just tell you the reality. Uh, Some of you guys uh, are going to go back on Monday, all right, and you're going to be exhausted and you're going to drink about 25 Red Bull, okay, on Monday, I understand. And then Tuesday, school's going to happen again. Can everyone go, oh. Yeah, it's going to happen, all right? It's coming, it's coming. But, But here's the thing, listen. Some of you, you're going to walk into your school on Tuesday no different. No different. You'll have come this weekend, you'll have had a good time, you'll have met some good friends, and that's really good. But there are some, listen to me, there are some that on Tuesday, I'm telling you, when you get back on Monday, you're not going to wait till Tuesday. You're going to get in, you're going to tell your parents or your friends about what happened this weekend. And when you begin to walk down the hallways of your junior high and high school, I'm telling you, you will be living a different life. Why? Because you have grasped how wide and how high and how deep and how unending the love of God is, not for just anyone, but for you. Now, you're going to be walking a different way. What the Word says is going to become true, not in someone else's life, but in your life. That you're going to be a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You're going to begin to live this unleashed life, but here's what you got to understand. The only way we live an unleashed life is when we come to that place in our life where we reach out and we take the hand of this God who sent his son Jesus that offers us an unending love. That's the only way. Other ways, otherwise, it's going to fizzle out by Thursday. We've got to reach out. We've got to take the hand of our God. And here's what I want to ask you. Why wouldn't you do that. Aren't, aren't you tired of the leash of shame? Aren't you tired of that? H- how about the leash of comparison? Aren't you exhausted by that? 
comparing yourself to all your classmates, comparing yourself to anyone and everyone. Aren't you exhausted with that leash of comparison? How about the leash of apathy? Like you just don't care. I mean, you're just kind of indifferent. How about the leash of trying to earn God's approval? The reality is you already got it. How about the leash of popularity or the leash of perfection, the leash of regret? You see, usually at weekends like this, they wait till like Sunday to have this kind of talk. And you guys, like I can tell by the looks on your face, you're like, man, they're like not even warming us up. They're just like getting right down to it. And that's true. We don't want to waste a minute this weekend. And so tonight is the opportunity. Tonight's the opportunity for every single one of you to reach out and to take the hand of Jesus Christ, to receive his unending love for you. And I'm telling you, from that place, you begin to live an unleashed life. Jesus wants to make history tonight through you. So here's, here's the opportunity. I'm going to be as clear as I can. Uh, some of you that are going to say yes tonight uh, for the first time, over here in the corner, I want you to go over there when the night's done, before you leave this room, and I want you to fill out one of these cards. It's the I said yes card, all right? Some of you are going to say yes. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that here in a minute. Uh, some of you, uh, you're going to say no. You are, right? You're just going to say no, it's not for me. Some of you are going to say maybe here in a few seconds. You're going to say maybe. And I respect that, and all of your leaders respect that, okay? And what maybe means is this, is that you're going to lean in the rest of the weekend. When you have small group time, you're going to lean in. You're going to listen. You're going to pay attention. Maybe it's okay, all right? But some of you right now, you're ready to say yes. Man, the leaders in this room, you've already said yes. And so you're going to get to say yes again. High school students, junior high students, that you already are living an unleashed life, you're going to get to say yes again. But there are some of you that you're going to say yes to Jesus for the first time. And January 16th, 2015 is going to be a marker day in your story. It's the day that you began to live an unleashed life. So here's how we're going to do it. Lewis, you're going to help me with this, all right? So we're going to count down from five, all right? And when I get to one, all right, when I get to one, everyone who's ready to say yes again, leaders, student leaders, you've already said yes, but you're going to get to say yes again. And those of you that are ready to say yes to Jesus Christ, those of you that are ready to say, you know what, I'm done trying to earn my way to heaven, all it does is get you tired, All it does is get you frustrated. Those of you that are ready to say yes for the first time, what you are saying yes to is that you are in fact a sinner and that you need Jesus to forgive you and to save you and to send you in a completely different direction, an unleashed kind of life. So we're going to count down from five. And when we hit one, every person in the room that's ready to say yes, you're going to stand to your feet and you're going to make some noise to the degree that this roof is going to come off. All right? We good on that? All right, so five. God came down and lived with us in the form of a man, and that man's name was Jesus. Four, he lived a perfect life without sin to be an example to show us how we can live to be pleasing to him. Three, he hopped on a cross, and he bled and died for my sins, for your sins, and for the sins of the whole world. Two, on the third day, he did something incredible that no man has ever done before. He rose. He was resurrected, and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's count up from five, five, four, three, two, one. going to do before we continue on. We're going to pray and we're going to celebrate with God. What the word says is that when just one person returns home to their heavenly father, it says that heaven celebrates. And so we're going to pray and we're going to thank God and then we'll move on with the rest of our time. Father, we love you and we are here for you. We're here not just to sing with volume, but we're here to sink deep into the matchless, outrageous, unending love of God. And I pray for every student and leader in the house tonight. Those that said no, God, we know that you are still searching and chasing after them. God, I pray for every student that said maybe. God, we respect that. 
But I, God, I ask that this weekend they would lean into you. And, Father, we celebrate those that said yes yet again and those that have said yes for the first time. Depopulating hell is what you are all about. And so, God, we celebrate that. And we thank you for your love. We celebrate your love. God, may we be in awe and wonder yet again of this love that you have invited us to swim and sink in. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.